The Tennessee Titans have traded DeAndre Hopkins and Ernest Jones. What is going on? Is it a fire sale in Tennessee? We're going to react to these trades and talk about other players that may or may not be on the move from Nashville soon. This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Just so you guys know, um, we're all aware of everything that's out there. Um, there's not anything I can comment on specifically uh, right now due to the, the nature of how these things work. Um, but definitely aware of what's out there. And, and look, I would expect um, some movement on our roster uh, over the next uh, period of time here. Oh, welcome everyone to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast brought to you by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver with me as always, Justin Mello and Justin. That sound you just heard was Brian Callahan at his Wednesday morning press conference saying, expect more roster movement. Now it's unclear if he's talking about the reported trades that have already come out but are not official, or if he means maybe there could be even more movement. He finished that comment by saying, again, I can't comment on anything until it becomes official. So it seems to indicate that those two trades that have been reported are 100% happening and that who knows, maybe there will be more trades. What's up, Justin, how's it going? Doing well. It's it's funny how things work. Like for our listeners, our viewers, um, we were planning on scrapping today's Lions preview episode anyway. Like normally, if you follow this podcast on Wednesday, we do a game preview, and we actually promised that on the last episode. But after that one ended, Graver and I talked, and we're like, we're gonna keep doing game previews, but let's skip this one. You know what? The trade deadline's coming up. Titans clearly should move some players. So this is actually going to be a, a trade deadline preview episode saying stuff like the Titans should trade DeAndre Hopkins. Well, instead, you're get, getting a reaction episode to the Titans trading DeAndre Hopkins and Ernest Jones, maybe one that's a, a little bit unforeseen for us potentially. Then we're also talk about, as Graver said, some other candidates that could be moved here. So the trade deadline is Tuesday, November 5th. That's two weeks from yesterday as of the time of this recording. And Justin, thank God the Titans traded Hopkins before. I mean, I woke up on the east, sorry, on the west coast. I woke up this morning to this trade already happening. Um, I actually woke up at like 5 a.m. just because, um, I don't know, I couldn't sleep. Checked my phone, saw the trade, sent some messages in the chat group, and then went back to sleep for three hours. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, woke up to the news of this trade, and thank God, because otherwise we would have come on here, recorded a podcast that would have been completely irrelevant an hour later, or it may have made us look really smart. But regardless, the Titans have traded DeAndre Hopkins. So let's talk about it, because the trade terms here are interesting. They get back a fifth-round pick from the Kansas City Chiefs, which could become a fourth-round pick if the following conditions are met. DeAndre Hopkins from this point forward plays at least 60% of the snaps for the Chiefs. And the kicker, the Chiefs make it to the Super Bowl. This is crazy. This is a crazy term. Like We see <laughs> roster bonus incentives like this all the time where it's like if the team makes it this far and you play the X percent of snaps, you get a bonus. If they make it to the AFC Championship, if they make it to the Super Bowl, like the bonuses increase. But to include that as a conditional term on a draft pick, if it was any team besides the Chiefs, I think it would be outlandish to even ask for it. Um, but even being the Chiefs and even the fact that they're undefeated and everything, and the fact that they've won back-to-back -back Super Bowls and they're going for a third, I still think it's kind of crazy that this is a term in this trade. Like it couldn't have been makes the AFC Championship game or wins a playoff. Like they have to make it all the way to the Super Bowl for this pick to become a fourth rounder. Otherwise, it'll be a fifth rounder, which is still fine, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think realistically, I was hoping the Titans would get a fourth rounder in a deal involving Hopkins. So I'll say I'll be slightly disappointed if it only ends up being the fifth. I mean, you look at what Amari Cooper right. and Vontae Adams went for. And I think Adams is on another level uh, from Cooper and Hopkins. I think he's one of the best receivers in the NFL still at this point. But Cooper, uh, I think pretty similar. And he's had a pretty similar year to Hopkins. Like, he hasn't played very well. He's in an offense that was limiting his upside. He struggled with some drops. Like, Cooper's not having a great year, and Cleveland still got more for him, if memory serves me correctly, than Tennessee got. Now, again, I was hoping for a fourth. I still hope it ends up being a fourth. I'll only be ever so slightly disappointed if it's a fifth, because I, I think they could have done a little bit better. Uh, yeah, the incentives are a bit nuts, but hey, when you've won two Super Bowls and you're 6-0, and oh, I think you could realistically say, hey, this is a realistic incentive that we might hit, so... And hopefully they do, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I've got no dog in the or no horse in the race, if you will. And uh, 
Uh, I hope they get there so the Titans get a fourth. I, I will say the NFL, and this is not a Chiefs podcast, but if you've watched the Chiefs this year, they're what, 6-0, and 7-0, and whatever the hell they are, uh, and they're winning ugly. Oh, and yeah. that's a terrifying thought for the NFL. They're not playing very well at all. You know what this win streak reminds me of? Call me nuts. I got to relate everything back to the Titans. Remember when the Titans won like five games in a row in 2022? in the middle of the year when they beat like the Colts, the commanders, the and none of the wins were impressive. That's kind of like what this chiefs, like Mahomes is throwing like the most interceptions in the league. He's got more interceptions than touchdowns. Like they are winning ugly. That's terrifying. Very realistic. They're going to get back to the super bowl. He is by far their best healthy receiver. Like they're throwing the friggin Noah gray and J- Justin Watson and, and uh, Juju Smith Schuster. Like Hawkins should be by far their best healthy receiver on the roster. Should play 60% if he stays healthy and never say they should make the Super Bowl because there are some great teams in the AFC. We'll see what happens. The Bills, the Ravens are playing well, but they're the Chiefs and they should, I guess, make the Super Bowl and hopefully this becomes a fourth round pick. I will not say they should make the Super Bowl. Is there a good chance? Are they a top three team in the AFC chance to make the Super Bowl? Absolutely. But should? Should is crazy. That would require a healthy season for the rest of the way for a team that has been extremely unhealthy and unlucky with injuries so far. But I do agree if Hopkins is healthy, there is no question in my mind he plays 60% of snaps. Whether Hollywood Brown comes back towards the end of the season or not, that's not going to really impact it. Whether Juju Smith-Schuster comes back soon or not, I don't think it's going to have a big impact on Hopkins snaps. Like He inserts as their wide receiver one from day one and he's not practicing on Wednesday so we'll see if he can even get into the game on Sunday I don't know if that will affect the snap count threshold thing if if Sunday's game will count because that seems kind of unfair Diana Rossini did report that they're already expecting him to play wow okay so um yeah then then he probably will get in the game this Sunday even if he's not at practice on Wednesday he'll probably get into practice on Thursday and Friday and they'll try to bring him up to speed as quickly as possible but he's going to be their best receiver the day he steps in foot in the building, like no doubt about it right now, based on who's healthy. Um, So I definitely expect him to be productive there. And Titans fans, if you're tired of cheering for a Titans team that absolutely sucks, you now have a major incentive to root for the Chiefs to get to the Super Bowl. And maybe that'll make the rest of 2024 kind of fun. You can go bandwagon onto maybe the best team or a, a top three team in the league and enjoy the rest of the season watching them try to get to the Super Bowl because you know it helps your Titans. Um, Let's talk about the other trade that went down, though. Ernest Jones the fourth, like you hold said. Hold on, hold on. I don't know if we're ready to move on from this yet, but I quickly want to add, um, you know, this was a no-brainer for the Titans, right? Like, as much as I love watching DeAndre Hopkins, how great of a player he was last year and how important he's been, this is a 32-year-old receiver on an expiring contract, right? Can we just quickly acknowledge that? This makes sense for the Titans. Like, we were going to come on here today and call for something like this to happen. True. And I always thought the Chiefs were a likely landing spot, especially after the Bills made their move. Uh, and, I mean, I guess no one cares about the Jets, but the Jets made their move before they were 2-5. and five. So, uh, uh, certainly, I think, an expected outcome here. And a no-brainer, 32 expiring contract, rebuilding team. Remember, you entered today, being Wednesday, without a third-round pick as the result of the luxurious need trade. So, no, you didn't get a third, but hopefully you have two fourths or you'll have two fifths. Always helps a little when you don't have a pick in an earlier round. Uh, no brainer for Rand Carthon. Yeah, I'm glad you you kept us on this topic, actually, because I did have one more thing to say. The Chiefs were reportedly talking to the Rams about trading for Cooper Cup. And the reason they decided to trade for Hopkins instead was because, number one, the Titans are picking up a good chunk of Hopkins' remaining salary for this year, about half is what was reported. Not that it matters for the Titans because they have plenty of cap space, but that's a, a part of this trade. And then the other side of it was that it only cost them a fifth slash conditional fourth, as opposed to the Rams who are reportedly looking for a two for Cooper cup, who is over 30 years old and dealt with a lot of injury issues. And even this year is not played very much and is expected to be back this weekend, but or tonight, so, tomorrow night, he's expected to be back, but a yeah. second round pick for Cooper cup versus a fifth round pick for Deandre Hopkins. If you're the chiefs, that's a no brainer. Yeah, but it sounds like you were describing Hopkins there too. Over 30 hurt, well, yeah. hurt this year. But but big difference in the capital. Before we move on to Ernest Jones, the last thing I'll say is, again, slightly disappointed that the Titans picked up some of this salary and couldn't just get an outright fourth. That's all I mean. Like, that should have given them an additional bargaining chip. Yeah. Uh, look, they got Jarvis Brownlee Jr. in the fifth round last year and Cedric Gray in the fourth. So maybe the fifth is better anyway. For the t- oh, No, all kidding aside, uh, having given up 
Cedric Gray. But uh, I, I do hope this ends up being a fourth because I'm not one of those unrealistic guys. You know, they're going to get a second for DeAndre Hopkins. Knowing how the NFL works, I thought slash hoped it would be a fourth. So still hope that that's the outcome here. So continuing on the trade news, the Titans trade linebacker Ernest Jones the fourth to the Seattle Seahawks for linebacker Jerome Baker, who should be a very familiar name to Titans fans. In fact, Justin, you and I recorded a just-in-case emergency pod. Titans signed Jerome Baker back in like March. Uh, never aired that one because they didn't sign him. And uh, he ends up signing with Seattle after he took a visit to Tennessee, if you remember. Um he was dealing with like a hamstring or a knee or he was dealing with some kind of injury in the preseason training camp that he didn't play much, but he hamstring put, during the preseason. Yeah. I think, yeah. But he's played in five games, I believe this year for Seattle, the Titans give up Ernest Jones, a fourth for Jerome Baker and a fourth round pick from Seattle. So they trade What was it? A five, six pick swap to the Rams for Ernest Jones. And then they flip him around for another linebacker and a higher pick. This is great. This is a great move from Rand Carthon. And I loved Ernest Jones before. I thought he was playing outstanding here in Tennessee. You know, came in late in training camp. Didn't play very much early the first week or two, but picked up the defense, I thought, fairly quickly and was making an impact on the field. Great as a blitzer, pretty good in coverage, had a pass deflection this past weekend um, in the last game against uh, whoever they, the Bills, that they just got trounced by. But uh, he played decently in that game, at least in the first half. And um, now he's out the door. He was on another guy that was on an expiring contract. So, Two players that were on expiring contracts, you turned them into draft picks and another player in Jerome Baker, who's also on an expiring contract, to figure out, you have now 11 games to figure out if you want to retain him for next season. And Mike Herndon, our buddy Mike Miracles, pointed out on Twitter that he always thought Jerome Baker was a better fit next to Kenneth Murray because he's decent in coverage, whereas Kenneth Murray and Ernest Jones are sort of very similar players in terms of the aggressive downhill nature they play with. Now, in my opinion, Ernest Jones is a much better player overall than Kenneth Murray, and if you're going to keep one, I would have rather kept <laughs> Ernest Jones. Um, but this is a rebuilding team, so it doesn't really matter which one you keep at this point. Get the draft capital while you can. Bring in a player that may end up being re-signed next year, and... Uh, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, uh, I want to add that the Ernest Jones, the pick swap with the Rams, by the way, that was in 2026. So it wasn't even, I mean, so they like they swapped picks in 2026 with the Rams for Ernest Jones. They gave up virtually nothing. They got rid of a fifth and got a sixth back. And I believe the pick coming from Seattle is a 2025 fourth. So it even it's even better uh, when you add that caveat sort of thing or that detail um, uh, to the occurrence here. Uh yeah, quickly, Jerome Baker is not as good of a football player as Ernest Jones. No. And, you know, I saw Mike said that, and I had someone jump in my mentions, and it's just a false sense of reality here that I want to address. Someone jumped in my mentions on Twitter and said, he's got better stats this year. Like, this is a home run deal for the Titans. Seattle Seahawks are not stupid, ladies and gentlemen. This is an upgrade for them. They know that. Uh, I don't know if people know this, but I write three Seahawks stories a day. People probably don't know that because I don't I didn't really even, publicize it. I didn't even know they that. Have not had, they have not had good linebacker play this year, okay? They went into Sunday's game against the Falcons, allowing five yards per carry, one of the worst run defenses in the NFL. Their head coach, Mike McDonald, who's a defensive-minded head coach, has consistently said it's been a linebacker's issue. They're not playing gap sound football in the run game. That is on Jerome Baker. Now, uh, I'll, I don't know if I can throw it back to you, but I'll keep going here because – uh, this one caught me slightly off guard, maybe like I, it didn't and it did. He's on an expiring contract. They need assets. That's why it doesn't catch me off uh, off guard. But the reason that it did is I thought he was playing really good football. He's still a young player. And I thought they would have had interest in resigning him. You can say the same thing about like a Dylan Radins, right? Like if they traded Dylan Radins right now, who's a young guy in a contract year that's playing starting caliber football for them, we would say, well, you know, yeah, he's on a contract year, but I thought they'd resign him to be the right guard next year. I guess the one difference is, you know, linebacker, not a premium position. No doubt about that. It's a non-premium. They drafted two linebackers in April in Cedric Gray and James Williams. Cedric Gray, by the way, is getting close to making his debut. It sounds like he's going to be activated off IR and practicing really soon. They got a linebacker back in Jerome Baker. They could play right away. 
next to Kenneth Murray. They uh, drafted James Williams in the seventh round, and they've got Jack Gibbons, you know, a guy that they're also comfortable with playing if push comes to shove. So it's a crowded linebacker room. You add in a Jerome Baker's probably the best one in it, and uh, besides Kenneth Murray, in terms of who's going to play right now. Uh, and on top of it, look, a fourth round pick, even if they were interested in keeping Ernest Jones, re signing him. I could see why maybe a fourth round pick convinced them. Like, say what you will. This is a much better piece of business than the Hopkins deal, right? Like, this is way better value. I couldn't believe they get a fourth round pick for an Ernest Jones and maybe a fifth for DeAndre Hopkins. Now, ideally, you added two fourth round picks on Wednesday, and now you've got three fourth round picks in April. And that more than probably makes up for not having the third, even though your third is going to be really early because you suck. It, it still stings to not have it. But having three fourths would be great. Uh, really shrewd piece of business. I mean, ter- you, you turned a 2025 fifth into a two, th- sorry, this is going to be confusing. You turned a 2026 fifth into a 2025 fourth and 2026 sixth, right? I think I said that correctly there. And Jerome Baker. Think of and, him what you and will. probably 11 games for Jerome yeah. Baker, because I, I, I think people, it's more of a toss in than I think people realize. Yeah. But, uh, but if he I, does, look, I don't think there's a rule. Could you re sign Ernest Jones in the, I guess not re sign, but could you sign Ernest Jones in the offseason? I mean, probably not, but never say never that deal would look so much better if you did but yeah. ultimately i was a little eyes this is a good football player i thought could be a building block for this defense but you can never guarantee he was going to resign when you're on an expiring deal and you get it off that blows you away because i think this one blew me away a fourth round uh, on an expiring deal you got to take it yeah absolutely i i do think this trade shocked me. i mean it absolutely shocked me i'll say it like not because I don't think the Titans are in fire sale mode, which they they clearly are, but we didn't know that until we woke up this morning and these trades started happening that were like, oh, and like any trade that happens from this point forward will not surprise me at all because now it's like basically everyone is up for grabs if they can get good value for them. But before the trade happened, like we had heard some rumblings about Hopkins. Oh, one other thing I meant to say about Hopkins, Brian Callahan officially lied to us for the first time ever, like that we know of. What do you say? Because on in Monday's press conference, he said that Hopkins was dealing with some lower leg thing that kept him out of the end of the Bills game, and that if he had been healthy, he would have gone back in. And we now know that clearly they were holding him out because they were planning to trade him. And Brian Callahan has been very forthright and honest pretty much since he started this job. And this is the first time that I think we can say he, like, you're telling me he didn't know what was going on. Give me a break. I don't, I'm not as confident as you are. I'll be honest, because these things sometimes develop quickly. Like today's Wednesday. That was on Sunday. I don't know. But we heard rumblings. We heard rumblings on Sunday. No, but we heard rumblings already that Hopkins was potentially going to be moved and that that's potentially why. I think for the most part, though, that was dot connecting, right? Like I I, I could have told you Amari Cooper was going to be moved. He's an old receiver on an expiring contract on a terrible football team. Yeah, but. This is crazy to me. Then if the Chiefs were trading for a guy who was in too injured to play in the fourth quarter in the second half, essentially, of that game, why would That's they true. be trading for him? So th- to me, true. like this is a clear example of Brian Callahan saying, saying, some, saying one thing for the first time that we can document and knowing something else is actually going on. But anyway, back to Ernest Jones. This did surprise me because, yes, I just thought that, like you said, he was playing well. I mean, he's one of the best players on their defense if you just look at like pure yeah. skill and talent as a defensive player. Um, And he'd been playing like it. And I think going to Seattle and playing for Mike McDonald, he's going to be playing at an all-pro level. I'm not saying he's going to make an all-pro this year, but Mike McDonald's going to get Ernest Jones playing at a very high level. He's going to be the Roquan Smith of that Seattle defense that Mike McDonald had in Baltimore when Roquan Smith was playing like one of the best linebackers in the league and still is. Um, Like that's the role Ernest Jones is going to fill. And he's got the skill set to really thrive in that environment. And I don't want Titans fans to look back on this and say, man, we should have kept this guy. Look at him. He's an all pro linebacker. And we only, all we got was a fourth round pick for him because I feel like that's going to happen in the next year or two, if, especially if he resigns with Seattle. Like that's the Mike McDonald defense relies on that linebacker to be excellent. And you're saying, you know, Jerome Baker and the other starting linebacker there were not performing up, up to par. And that's why Seattle's defense hasn't played well because Mike McDonald needs a really good linebacker in the middle of that defense to execute the whole scheme and make it all come together. And we saw Isaac Garendo run for like 75 yards on that last play of that Seahawks uh, 
exactly. 49ers game last Thursday before they sealed the deal with a Kyle Juszczyk touchdown. But um, yeah, so Seattle's run defense not been good. And we'll see if Jerome Baker can be any better. Justin, let's move on to our surging performer this week, brought to you by Chris Gates Fitness and his online fitness training camp. And my surging performer is Rand Carthon. Because Rand Carthon last year had the chance to do this fire sale thing that the Titans are clearly doing right now. I'm going to play a sound from Black Ops 2, if anyone remembers playing this. Nazi zombies. Uh, fire sale sound. Because the Titans are in fire sale mode right now. And thank God, Rand Carthon recognized this year, and maybe he tried to do it last year and Mike Vrabel stopped him. We'll never really know the answer to that story. Um, but last year, there are all the rumors about Derrick Henry and any other potential trade candidates and no trades happen. The Titans were like stuck between rebuilding and trying to compete. And this year they know what they are. Thank God they know what they are. They're selling the assets while they have value. They're getting assets in return that they can use. They're getting capital in return that they can use to build up this roster in a cheap way with these draft picks. You love to see it. So Rand Carthon, you are my surging performer for the week. It makes a lot of sense, right? Look, this team's going nowhere fast this year, and they need all the draft capital they can get to try to accelerate the rebuild. And on top of it, don't underrate, like, the more capital you have, the easier it is to move around the board, exactly. right? If, if, if they're going to be thinking about drafting a quarterback, that stuff matters, right? And we assume they're going to at least think about drafting a quarterback. So uh, you're going to need capital. So uh, I, I totally get it. And look, uh, if you're looking for a positive, uh, Rand Carthon, I, I, it looks like had a pretty damn good first draft, right? Like J.C. Latham, Tavondre Sweat, Jarvis Brownlee Jr. Uh, jury's still out on guys like uh, Cedric Gray and Jaquan Jackson. But don't be sure, you know, both those guys play positions that they just moved players from, right? Receiver and linebacker. So don't be shocked if they get more opportunities. And those guys prove to be pretty decent picks as well. So a lot of time still to decide uh, uh, about the draft class, but it looks like a damn good one. So it's, it's important that they've got more picks moving forward. Yeah, no doubt about it. That was our surging performance brought to you by Chris Gates Fitness and his online fitness training camp. Check out the online fitness training camp run by Chris Gates, who is an online fitness coach and a massive football fan who has created this fitness community that is designed specifically for football fans like you and I. If you're ready to elevate your health and fitness and do it with a group of like-minded people looking to support and encourage each other, you have to check this out. And to me, that is the key to the online fitness training camp is this community of people that holds you accountable and help you work towards your goals. My biggest challenge, I've said it before, has always been sticking to a workout plan. I always give up after, you know, three or four weeks. I'm like, you know what? I'm just, I'm lazy. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I don't really feel like doing it anymore. Well, these, this community of people holds you accountable and doesn't let that happen. If you join this week, use the code audible, you'll get 80% off your first month. That's $10 for a month which is a great way to see if this program will work for you. So don't miss out. Visit chrisgatesfitness.com slash training camp or click the link in this podcast description and start your journey today. Remember to use the code audible for 80% off your first month. All right, Justin, we're going to pair this one back to back with I'll drink to that. And I do have a coffee here. So I'll be drinking something. I've got nothing. All right, dad, yell at Justin Mello for not having a drink this time. It's not my fault. Um, and here's what I'm drinking to. It's in the same vein. I'm drinking to the fire sale idea that the Titans are getting behind because I want to use this to talk about other players that may be on the move. But look, to me, how many players are untouchable on this team, Justin? To me, it's like J.C. Latham, maybe Peter Skaronsky. I don't know. Is that it? I mean, the whole rookie class. The whole rookie right? class, Obviously, yeah. then I would add Roger McCreary, I think, to that because he's a building block. I mean, uh, cap de- cap wise, you're not going to move Calvin Ridley, Legereus Need. Like what well, you just committed to them makes them Im- immovable essentially. Yeah, so fair. there are a couple, Lloyd Cushenberry. I would add to that list, but uh, outside of that, no, there's probably not a, there's there's not many untouchable. So let's talk about Harold Landry from this standpoint because there was a report from ML Football. If you follow this account, I encourage you to unfollow. Um, but ML Football tweets that. I want to read the exact tweet. I'm sorry. We're going to, I'm going to bring this up give me one second to find it because this just makes me so frustrated. He tweets alarm uh, emoji news hashtag Titans pro bowl pass rusher. Harold Landry is all caps available via trade. Of course, via, via what else would it be via trade and is highly sought after by multiple contenders. Landry has been strongly linked to the Lions, Falcons, 49ers, and Commanders by front office personnel. He has recorded 12 and a half sacks in his last 17 games. That's the full tweet. No, Harold Landry 
might be available via trade per sources or according to other reporter who may have had this report. Like if you're going to tweet something like this or report something like this and you don't list a single source, even just to say per sources, like let me know person reading this tweet that you have talked to people who told you this or that you're resharing a report from another reporter who had sources. Like the fact that you can just tweet this and people are running with it. I know a lot of people, a lot of our listeners and a lot of our followers are smarter than that, but there are so many people reporting out there. According to ML football, Harold Landry might be traded to the 49ers. It's like, based on what? I need more than that. Based on what? Based on who said that? Based on you saw the Titans trade two players and Harold Landry is a player that somebody might want to trade for. And so you're going to throw this tweet out there. And if it happens, then you can look back and say, see, I was right. I had sources. I hate this kind of reporting. Sorry for the rant in the middle of I'll drink to that. But what I'll drink to is the Titans having a whole roster full of players that they are willing and ready to say, you know what? You did. You did great for us. We appreciate your contributions. And now we're going to move you for a draft pick. (laughs) Well, I, I kind of want to get into which guys we could see moved from here on out. So uh, let's lay it out like this. The Ernest Jones deal, to me, proves, uh, and, and to a more of extent, Jones than Hopkins, um, that every player on an expiring contract is probably available, yeah. right? So that's, you know, the ones that come to mind immediately, the veterans. And look, I don't know that they're going to get a single phone call on these players. So I'm not one of those guys. It's like, these guys are definitely going to get traded. No, there's got to, you know, it takes two to tango. Does anyone call about Tyler Boyd? I don't know. Does anyone call about Nick Folk? I don't know. Does anyone call about Quandre Diggs? I don't know. But three guys that would make a lot of sense, right? They're, they're way up there in age. I mean, Nick Folk's like 74. Uh, Quan, you know, those, those other guys are fairly old as well. Uh, you know, there's a chance they, they'd love to move those guys. I think if they get an offer, some of the lesser known guys on expiring deals, you know, a Sebastian Joseph day, I see him to a lesser extent like Ernest Jones, you know, he's on a one-year deal. I thought maybe you, you, you could resign him and he'll play a small role on your defensive line moving forward. Well, who knows, you know, if they get a good offer uh, to a lesser, I, I don't think they're going to move right in. So I, I just think right guard, is a spot that's more important for them. They got enough struggles up front. I, I actually, I can't believe we're in year four and talking about re-signing Dylan Radins, but life comes at you fast. You never know. And I actually do think they're going to re-sign Dylan Radins. So I, I don't think they move him. Uh, Daniel Brunskill, probably not, but look, he's got several years of good tape or decent tape, at least uh, as a starter. Offensive line is a pandemic around the NFL. Everyone needs better players there. Maybe you can convince someone for a six, seven swap or something along those lines. Uh, but let's, you know, those are the ones that are obvious expiring deals. Let's get into some of the bigger realistic ones. Like you talked about the Harold Landry report. I'm super torn on this one, you know, because I realize, you know, he, he's not ancient, but well, he's 28, uh, he creeping up there on 30. Uh, but he's pretty damn good, right? Like, yeah, he's not an all elite, you know, all pro type. We have this conversation all the time. That other spot opposite him at edge is already so bad. What is this team? And I'm not talking about this year. Who gives a shit about this year? But who the hell starting for you on the edge next year? Like, you got to go out. If you trade Harold Landry, you got to go out and get two legitimate starting edge rushers, a very expensive position, a position that's not easy to come by high-end guys. You already need one of them. You need two if you trade Harold Landry. I wouldn't be overly anxious to get myself into that kind of situation. You're not getting a first-round pick for Harold Landry. Who are we kidding? I don't think you're getting a second. Look, if you get a second, yeah, you you probably make that deal. If you get a third, I think you're on the 50-50 fence, I think is probably how I would treat it. Anything less than that, you're not even considering. Yeah, I think with Harold Landry and all these players we're talking about, I think an important thing to differentiate here is the difference between a guy on an expiring contract like a Hopkins or an Ernest Jones or any of the other guys you named and a guy that plays a premium position at a spot where you are already weak on your roster. Like you do not want to go create a massive hole that you have to fill, that you have to use this pick that you get for Harold Landry to fill next offseason. It's almost like when you traded A.J. Brown, not quite on that level. I was literally going to say that. I have to interrupt you because I was about to say, like when you were done and I didn't think you were going to go there, I underrated how smart you are. (laughs) But I I like, like it's it's the same thing. Oh, you said it's not, but like 
when I trade a guy for a pick, I trade an A.J. Brown for a first-round pick. Damn, I hope this pick I drafted is as good as A.J. Brown. Exactly. Right? Like, it's like, and guess what? It's Traylon Burks. He's not. Right. It's so the it's mystery like, box. you really got to be careful. The mystery box idea all over again. So you don't want to go create a massive hole. Now, if you're trading a linebacker and you have a bunch of young linebackers and the guy's going to be a free agent at the end of the year anyway, or receiver is a position you can say that the Titans are weak at, especially long-term future of that position. Um, but Hopkins what probably wasn't in the plans regardless anyway. So... I think trading Harold Landry would be a mistake because even if you get a second or a third, the odds that you draft a guy who can actually match what Landry's done for you with that pick are very low. And you, like you said, you still need another one. What are you going to do? Spend your first two picks in next year's draft on edge rushers? What are you going to do? Go sign a $150 million edge rusher in free agency? Like It's just, just poor cap management, poor roster alloc- management to do it that way. I agree. And as highly as we think of second and third round picks, I want to point something out. The Atlanta Falcons have been one of the worst defenses in the NFL at generating sacks over the last couple of years. Okay. The amount of second and third round picks that they have thrown at the edge position in recent drafts, and the Falcons are not a bad franchise by any stretch of the imagination. Go look it up. Oh, I can't even pronounce the guy's damn name. Arnold, uh, Ibitic, remember the Penn State? Arnold, Ibitic, E-B-I-K-E-T-I-E. Everyone around, he was high-end draft pick. He's got zero sacks this year. I think he's in his third year. You don't remember him? I do not. Arnold, Ibitic, I can't, I can't remember how to pronounce it now. I did in his draft year. Penn State, the high-end pick, zero sacks this year. They drafted Zach Harrison out of Ohio State. Last year in the third round, zero sacks this year. D'Angelo Malone, that was a dumb one at the time, but Western Kentucky small schooler, third round pick, zero sacks this year. Like you can't just assume, you know, your problems are always going to be solved by throwing third and second and third round picks at it. Look at the Falcons are last place in sacks this year. They traded for Matthew Judon in the offseason. Like you just, you got to hold on to a guy like Harold Landry when you've got him on a multi year deal. Look at the Titans right tackle position for an example of throwing second and third round picks at something exactly and not the same fixing thing. it. Yes. Um, now, one big name that we have not talked about yet, Jeffrey Simmons. There have already been reports, Paul Kaharski, A to Z, have both reported that there are no indications or that there are indications the Titans will not trade Jeffrey Simmons. No indications that they will trade, indications that they will not trade um, Jeffrey Simmons. I think that's a mistake, actually. I think they should move Simmons. Now, I think there is some caveats to that, which is, number one, he's on a huge contract which makes him harder to move. Number two, he hasn't played up to that contract, which makes him even harder to move. Number three, he's playing through a torn UCL, I believe, which if you follow baseball at all, you know that's like a devastating yet common injury for pitchers that like knocks them out for months. Obviously, it's different in football because you're not throwing 195 to 100 pitches a game, so it's a lot different uh, wear and tear on that elbow, but playing through a pretty massive elbow injury So there's a lot of factors working against the value that you would get for moving him. Like based on all those factors, you're probably not getting a day two pick, even though Jeffrey Simmons is certainly worth a day two pick as a player. But just from like being a Titans fan standpoint of it, I'm kind of tired of Jeffrey Simmons. (laughs) Like this guy uh, has had some really great moments, especially playing for Mike Vrabel had some really great moments. Those three sack games, the, the playoff game against the Bengals, but like, it feels like it's been forever since we've seen that version of Jeffrey Simmons. Like he has not been a dominant player for a while now and he's dealt with these injury issues every year. And frankly, I don't think he's lived up to the massive contract he signed. And Paul Kaharski pointed something out too. It was like the Titans use him on all their marketing materials because they think he's a draw. And at the end of the day, like he's not a draw. He's not a reason you go watch the Titans. You're not going to a Titans game in person so you can see Jeffrey Simmons. Like, frankly, there's nobody on the Titans right now that you're going to the game to watch them play. Like there was when they had a Derrick Henry and an AJ Brown and whatever. Um, but to me, like protecting Jeffrey Simmons, like he's some untouchable player because I don't know why. Now it's different if you're talking about the value. Like you're not going to get a very high pick because of the contract, because of the performance, because of the injury. That's one reason not to trade him. But if you're not trading him because you think he's like a building block, I think you're just overvaluing what Jeffrey Simmons is for your defense at this point. Yeah, it's definitely been a while since we've seen the dominant, you know, game wrecking version of Simmons. That's disappointing, you know, based on the contract. And we thought, you know, Denard Wilson going to fully unlock him or not. I don't want to say fully because he has been fully unlocked in the past. But we thought Denard Wilson was going to continue, uh, you know, having Jeffrey Simmons play at a high level. And you're next to Tavondre Sweat. It's hard to fathom why this year has probably been the worst of Jeffrey Simmons' career and all. Paul Kaharski, I don't want to say, I'm not going to say 
hates the guy, but he goes in on him quite frequently. And there've been a lot of tweets, a lot of stories written recently about how he thinks not nearly as good as they think he is. Everything you just said about him not being marketable, blah, blah, blah. They've stuffed him down our throats. He said at one point, uh, he's not the leader. Kevin Byard was, he said at one point, I believe Paul Kaharski said in the story or it was on a live podcast I was watching, but yeah, you know, for the right price, I'd consider it no doubt about it. But, as Paul's pointed out, I think based on the size of the contract, and again, I don't think Jeffrey Simmons is a disaster player for the Tennessee Titans. Like, I don't think this con- like remember the Andy Levitree contract. Like, I, I don't think it's quite that bad by any stretch, and I fully expect him to still be a very good player in this defense, maybe round his into form and get back to the dominant player that we expect him to be. But yeah, I, I think I'd be. It's crazy to say, but I'd almost be more willing to listen on him than I would Landry. Also, 100%. With, with the caveat. With the caveat, though, I'd also expect, I, I would think, you know, if they got offers for both, I would think the offer for Simmons would be better than it would be for Landry. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm wrong there, but thinking that, I, I would take that into account and say, yeah, I'd be more willing. I don't expect it to happen, though. I don't think they're moving either Simmons or Landry. Famous last words before we've got to do the immediate reaction uh, to them trading one of them, but I, I don't think those guys are getting moved. I don't either, but I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't rule it out, like you said, but I wouldn't expect it either. I would, I think it's more likely that a name we're not talking about is randomly the next guy traded. If the, if there's even a next guy, this could be it for all we know, yeah. but um, they do have almost two more weeks to figure out any more moves they want to do. If they lose again this weekend to the Lions, which spoiler alert, they will, they <laughs> will lose to the Lions by a lot. Um, you know what, Justin? Let's let's wrap up. I'll drink to that. I'll drink to that. Brought to you by Sinker's Beverages, the premier wine, spirits, and beer store in East Nashville, serving the community since 1985. Their knowledgeable staff is proud to help you with large parties, themed events, or finding something unique for a special occasion. From birthday parties to milestone celebrations to everyday moments, Sinker's can help with the right drink for every occasion. And if you head to the sinkersbeverages.com website or check the link in this podcast description, you can join the in crowd. In crowd members get access to allocated wines and spirits, exclusive events, early access to barrel releases, and more. Plus, Sinkers Beverages is on Uber Eats. All right, Justin, we said we weren't going to preview the Lions game. We should do a little tiny preview here. And by that, I mean we got to keep up with our predictions. We got to keep up. Okay, that's all the we're predictions. doing. That's all we're doing here. So let's uh let's catch up here. Hold on. on. Where let's we're also at. acknowledge because I guess it does matter. That it sounds like Mason Rudolph is going to start this game again. That's important yes. news. Will Levis did not throw a single pass at Wednesday's practice. Uh, ESPN, I think it was reported, he's probably another week away. Do expect him to re-enter the lineup when he's healthy, but it's going to be Rudolph again uh, against the Lions here. Good, good shout there, and I don't think it makes much of a difference at this point. After last week, is Mason Rudolph a four percent better quarterback? Maybe, but there's so many issues on offense. Now you don't have DeAndre Hopkins. It's like. I'm ready for this Titan season to be over. Maybe I'll root for the Lions. The Lions are way more fun to watch. Um, just to push the Titans draft pick. Uh, like, I'm sorry if you're one of those fans that's like, never root for a loss. Always root for your team to win. Like, that may be true, but the Titans have signaled to us with the moves they made on Wednesday that they are entering the tank. The tank is yeah. on. So definitely don't expect the Titans to. I mean, the players are going to try their hardest, obviously. And, you know, the Lions got down 10 nothing to the Vikings last week, just like the Bills got down 10 nothing to the Titans last week. And then the it, they sort of pulled the Bills, the Lions did. The difference is the Vikings' offense didn't completely die the way the Titans did. And they also got a fumble return touchdown from a David Montgomery fumble in that game that kept the Lions pretty much in the game. Without that, the Lions would have lost by two scores, probably. Um, or sorry, the Vikings would have lost by two scores, probably. But anyway... Looking ahead at this game, Justin, let's look at our predictions from last week. You had Bills 27, Titans 13. I had Bills 20, Titans 13. I had too much faith in the Titans defense that had been very good this season. We both didn't expect the Titans to do much on offense, but you were way closer with your final score. The final score, 34-10, you had 27-13, so you're way closer. So you get the win, so you're up to 5-1. and one. I am more like the Titans. I'm 1-5 in five. Um, <laughs> <laughs> predictions this year. So let's move on to predicting this game. What do you got for Lions Titans in Detroit? Uh, Lions 27, Titans 10. I'm going with, I don't think it's going to be close. Probably pretty similar to the Buffalo game, except the Titans won't be up 10 nothing this time. Uh, <laughs> uh, unless they, I mean, they get the ball first, scripted plays. It's the rest of the time that's uh, impossible. But uh, Lions 27, Titans 10, uh, another blowout loss. One and six. Hopefully move up in the draft order. They're currently fourth overall. 
uh, behind who the Patriots, the Panthers, and the Browns, I think, is the other one. So fourth overall at this point, yeah, unfortunately it's October, and I'm rooting them to move up the draft order. That's how good the season's been. I'm going to go Lions 37, Titans 13. I think it's just a complete and total domination by one of, if not the best team in football. Connor Orr, Sports Illustrated Power Rankings, has the Lions number one right now, ahead of the Ravens, wow. ahead of the Chiefs. Um, I have the Ravens number one and the Lions number two and the Chiefs number three. So I think they're the second best team in football. Connor Orr thinks they're the first best team in football. Um they are one of the best teams in football and the Titans are one of the worst. I mean, frankly, they are one of the worst teams in football. So I think this oh, will be another blowout, which is why we are not spending a whole episode previewing this game because what's the point? All right. Any last thoughts on trades, on the Titans, on this game, on the overall state of their team or any anything else you want to say before we get out of here? No, I guess it'll be exciting to follow over these next couple of weeks if any more moves are coming. It's good to see their stack of draft capital and building for the future. Uh, it's what they need. It's the only way they, they even have a chance to try to accelerate this rebuild and get out of this hole they've dug themselves in. So, uh, and, you know, tough moves today, especially losing a guy like Hopkins, who's been so great in the community, losing a guy like Ernest Jones, who you, you thought maybe was going to be a building block. But, you know, hopefully those draft picks will be vital to the rebuild. Yeah, and hopefully they can, like, package them to move up to get a more premium player because, again, replacing these guys with fourth and fifth round picks, not necessarily going to like, especially at receiver at linebacker. Sure. You can find great players in the fourth and fifth round at linebacker, but at receiver, it's a lot more difficult. Not saying it can't happen. Puka Nakua fifth round pick, but it's a lot more difficult. So anyway, as you said, we'll, we'll track these over the next couple of weeks. And if anything major breaks on a day that we're not already scheduled to record, and it's not a day that I am swamped with heed the call responsibilities, we might hop on and do, do an emergency pod, depending on how, the audience and Titans fans, how much you guys even care about the team right now because they are so bad. But anyway, that'll do it for this one. I always end these podcasts, Justin, with one phrase, a very famous phrase amongst Titans fans. It's the slogan of the Titans, tighten up. I might have to change it based on something Brian Callahan said in a press conference earlier this week when he said, tighten down. Yes, tighten down. That's what the Titans are doing this year. They are tighten down. So anyway, <laughs> thanks to everyone for tuning in. We appreciate you. Make sure you are subscribed to the channel. Give this video a thumbs up, like. Leave a comment below. What was your reaction to these trades? Who are Who's your list of most tradable players that you'd like to see the Titans ship off for draft picks here over the next two weeks or so? Um, let us know in the comments. And thanks also to our sponsors, Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville, Chris Gates Fitness and his online fitness training camp. We'll be back on Monday. Important note, I have a wedding on Sunday. I will not be in town. We will not be doing our recap on Sunday. But on Monday morning, first thing, first thing my time. So sorry for anyone not on the West Coast. Semi first thing Monday morning, you'll get our Titans Lions recap. Might be a short one, depending on how the game goes, but we'll see. All right. So until then, y'all stay safe out there and tighten down. Broadway Sports Media Production.